Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my class on how to behave badly according to 16th century Italian dance masters. I'm Nicolessa de Eisenfier, and today's class is part of the Atlantean September University 2020. Today, we are going to cover four main areas. We're going to go over the context in which these rules on how to behave badly are covered. We're going to talk about the clothing, how you can be behaved poorly just by what you're wearing or not wearing. We're going to talk through movements. Today, we're just going to hit a couple steps, not all the dance steps. That is a completely different class. And then we're gonna talk about balls and social outings and how they had many important rules for them as well. To start a little bit of context, Italy at this time was the center of culture, of dance, of fashion. It was all the information that we see from these Italian manuscripts are going to spread throughout Europe. So if you can behave badly here in Italy, you can behave badly anywhere you would like. At this time, the dance masters were primarily talking about court and balls and the social outings and get togethers thereof. These are critical times because this is when you have an opportunity to get A, get with the opposite gender, but B, see and be seen by all the other peers and nobility of your time. This is a chance to show your worth or to gossip about other people and how they are not worthy. This is really set up by how the balls were arranged. We sometimes refer to these as Caroso style balls modernly because you have the two lines of chairs set up on either side. And there's only one couple or one set dancing at a time. Thus, you have plenty of time to observe what they are doing in the dance, but also what everybody else about in the hall is doing as well. So in the manuals, when they talk about what is important in the dance, we also need to make sure that we know what is important throughout the rest of the hall so that as even you're seated, you are not causing a scandal or a stir. At the balls, it is also important to note that these were not just the slow stately affairs you may see in movies. There's gonna be a whole variety of speeds of dances. That's an entirely different class. There's also going to be the kick the tassel game, which Negri goes into great detail on, and we have this woodcut for her. This is a game where it's exactly what it sounds like. You are trying to kick the tassel in flowery, fun ways. And so while you may think everything is solemn and serious, there's actually a lot of chance for fun at these balls as well. And we do get some of the rules from uh, both the galliards and that game. For today's class, I'm just going to cover two Italian dance manuscripts, Ricci Caroso's Noblita de Dame in 1600s and Negri's Le Grazie de More in 1602. There are a lot of other, or a few other dance manuscripts available, both from the uh, in the 1500s that give different rules. When putting together this class, I realized there was too much material and I didn't want to get into the comparison of rules. So I wanted to take contemporaries and really focus us in during this time frame. Frankly, I already had to cut out some fantastic rules. So let's really just enjoy these. Now, when I talk about rules, in Caruso, he talks about rules and notes. Rules tended to be more about movements and steps. The notes were how to comport yourself at the balls and social interactions. Negri talks about warnings and rules, and these are very similar of how to behave and how to do the actual steps. There was a lot of borrowing between these two. Okay, let me rephrase. Negri plagiarized a fair bit of Caruso. There's another manuscript, the Santucci manuscript in 1614, who very carefully does not quite plagiarize both of them, but it is very close. It is like your essays where you change the wording just enough so that it's not exactly plagiarism, but it's plagiarism. So we see here there's about 150 rules, but in reality, the distinct number of rules is only about 100. That's still a lot of rules to go through. The other part that I really enjoy in the manuscript and in the books is how they're written. 
for instance, I have a copy of Noblita de Dame here. And the way this is set up is that it is written between the master and the student. The student always asks for information and the master is more than obliged to give it. And in, much, in very flowery language, at times it makes me wonder if they were paid by the word. Student, I am quite pleased with this excellent information, but now tell me, if you will, whether the mantles of which we have spoken are not worn differently on certain occasions. Master, yes they are, but this, since this is a matter outside my profession, I had not planned to discuss it with you. Now that you have asked me about it, however, I feel constrained to give you my opinion. And then he goes on for nearly a page, just describing how to wear your cloak or your mantle. It makes for quite a fun read. As we go through this presentation, you also get to see some fantastic quotes that are taken straight from the books. Notably, these were written in Italian, translated into English, but the quotes are still so fantastic and such a joy to bring to all of you. Let's talk about how do we know these were poor behaviors? I, am I just making this up? I am not. There's a number of directly stated ways that Caruso and Negri say straight up, do not follow the custom of some who, and they'll describe exactly what the person is doing in multiple ways of doing it, which means we know they did it. But we also know this indirectly because why would you have a rule about something if nobody ever did it? We would never have a rule in there about don't bring your pet llama into the court because nobody was bringing their pet llama into the court. We don't need to say, don't do it. So there's a particular joy of saying, okay, if, yes, there's a story behind every rule. So if we're saying don't do something, it means there were people definitely doing it. And then you disagree as to who um, who was actually proper. And in some cases in the manuals, they actually disagree with each other. And that's because the dance masters are competing. And Caruso makes note that as a proper gentleman, you should make sure to shun people with bad behavior. So I'm going to instead teach you how to behave badly, and then you can ignore all the shunning around you. Let's talk about clothing. There's a lot that goes into this. And I found these the most joyful because for a lot of folks who are not dancers, the rules about the steps will maybe not resonate as much. So let's talk clothing. I'm gonna go through four sets for men, the hat, gloves, cape, and sword, and then two for ladies, chopins and dress. So let's do a little bit of context before we go into the rules. This is an actual wood carving out of the Caroso uh, manuscript. So it gives us a good sense of what they were wearing exactly at this time period. So as I'm going through the rules, this is what you're thinking about. You're not necessarily thinking about Elizabethan. We're not thinking, um, you, we're not thinking about Vikings and they all have different styles. So let's take a few moments to look at these items. So first, notice that there is a hat bonnet in the Lord's hand. He has it down in his left hand. And we'll go over that and he's holding the lady's right hand. He is wearing his sword, as always, it is critically important you have your sword with you. Wearing a cape, so that's the mantle uh, drawn over it. Look at the lady's train. So she has a nice large dress. So she's got the farthingale underneath the dress, holding it all up. And then she's got a train extending backwards. This is going to come into play for many of the rules about the ladies. It's what you should and should not do with your train. And while we don't, aren't going to talk a rule specifically about the handkerchief in her hand, notice that she's got a handkerchief she's holding on to. Part of this is that there are some other woodcuts, and may show them, where the sleeves actually come up around the wrist instead of being split like this, and she could stuff the handkerchief or gloves in the sleeve of her wrist. So as we're talking these rules, think this picture, and then as complete a side for basically plugging in my fitness classes. Look at those calves, Mwah. Italian calves of steel. Do more reprises, everybody. So I teaser trailered. Why does it take three pages to take on or off your hat? This was very important. Everybody during this time frame would be wearing a hat. If you don't have video of me on, this is a part where I'm using a prop. So, 
everybody would be, or all the gentlemen would always be wearing hats and you'd be basically wearing them all the time. This is going to come into play shortly. So you're wearing your bonnet. I have a picture there of Caruso. I'm in the process of recreating that hat, but have not finished it yet. It's got a nice wire structure underneath it, standing up good and well. But the hat I'm wearing is based on Elizabethan flat cap. For purposes of demonstration, it will do well enough. So if you would like to behave badly, you can start right away with just how you're wearing, how you're taking off your hat. Because we are going to take off our hat to honoring. So the first way to do this completely inappropriately is take that hat with your full hand and just grab it off. You're raising it from the top, you're grazing it in your full hand. And it's quite unseemly. The next way you can, and then you bring it out in front of you as such. For, and this is a quote in all the places where it's actually quoted, are quotes. This reminds us of those poor cripples who beg for alms. So clearly, fine gentlemen such as yourself would not be doing that. But if you'd like to behave badly, go ahead, ask for some alms. There are many other fine gentlemen with money near around you. The final way that we'll go over right now of how to take off your hat improperly is when you take it off and you can't see me because I don't have full length, is you hold the brim forward or back. The reason for this is if you are holding it forward or back, people in front can see or people behind you can see. And what are they seeing? You're wearing this hat all day, every day, constantly. You're not buying lots of new ones. It is gross. It is full of perspiration. And Caruso even says that it is unlikely that you will be able to clean the perspiration. Therefore, it presents an indecent and repulsive sight to one's beholders. So naturally, if you would like to insult somebody, go ahead. Face your hat towards them with the unseemly, sweaty, disgusting brim or rim of the hat. Now, I did say we could learn some ways to properly take off the hat in case you would like to honor your lady instead of insulting your lady. What we are going to do is we are going to take off our hat with our right hand. Notably, the right hand is the more noble hand. We'll take the bonnet by the brim, we will take it off and we will slide it down the inside of our body, down to our, our thigh. You will then pretend to kiss your left hand. Notably, we're only pretending, we're not actually touching it. And it is not the back of the hand as you see in modern movies, we're pretending to kiss the fingers. Why the left hand? Well, naturally, as Carosa says, it is the hand that belongs to the heart. So right hand is more noble, left hand belongs to the heart. Now, many of us here, because we love dance, if you are dancing with a lady, you are going to take the lady's hand in your right. Huh, you're holding the bonnet in your right. You will transfer the bonnet to the left, being very careful to keep that unsightly brim facing your leg. And then you will kiss your right hand, pretend to kiss your right hand, and then take the lady's hand. And at this point, you will do your reverence. Throughout the dance, you, are, you may be holding your hat, but then you will also put it back on later and throughout the balls. So you should always be wearing your hat. Many options, personal, my favorite of which being show off that awful perspiration to all around. The next one, gentlemen and ladies, in fact, actually, we are all wearing our gloves. It is the fine and proper thing to do to wear your gloves at a ball. However, you do not wear your gloves while dancing. Therefore, you have arrived at the ball, you are wearing your gloves, you are wearing them in the hall. When a lady comes to approach you to ask you to dance, you should take off your gloves. Well, if you are trying to behave badly, there are many ways you can do so improperly with your gloves. The first of which that I do, I do every winter is as such. You just go ahead and bite 
the middle finger of your glove with your mouth and pull it off. There are multiple references in there that is an unseemly way of taking off your glove. And then Caruso goes a bit further to say he has seen some where the finger of the glove remains in the mouth while all in attendance laugh. This is what I love about Caruso. He has no problem telling you that everybody is going to uh, laugh at you. Also, your gloves are probably disgusting as someone just pointed out. Yeah, you don't want anything that's been touching things in your mouth. And yet, think about this class this winter when you absolutely do that and are not thinking about it. Next, this is where the SCA is really good at behaving badly, is it is not appropriate to dance without a cape. And yet, every ball I go to, all of you fine lords are not wearing a cape. This is not appropriate to the nobility. In fact, I behave so badly, I don't even own a cape. So to do this demonstration, I have a handy dandy blanket, close enough. So we're going, there's two basic ways we see in the picture they're wearing their cape. Notably, there's no tie on the cape, so the blanket actually works. And you, you're not gonna have a tie, you're not gonna have pins holding it on, so you have to arrange it properly. So the first way that you really should not be wearing it is exactly how I am with the levels down on the side. It makes you look like a pedant. You clearly cannot wear your cape properly. Instead, you should have it hanging off your left shoulder as such. Very much like wearing our baseball caps off to the side. It is far more fashionable to have it off the left shoulder. However, as we see in the second picture, if your cape is very long, you're gonna wrap it around your body. Now, if you wanna behave badly, and as a bonus, put everybody around you at risk, go ahead and wrap that uh, sword hilt up in the cape. That way, if somebody is threatening you, you cannot get the sword out in time because it's wrapped in the cape. So, but double bonus, behave badly and endanger the lives of everybody around you. Let's talk swords, in fact, a bit more. You shall, as a lord, you are always wearing your sword and it is on your left side. The lady is gonna be on the right, your sword is on the left side. But, and this is one of those, we know people did it because there's a rule against it. They say, be careful not to push your sword hilt down such that it points skyward. And if Sophia the Orange were here, she would be much, be quite happy to know that Capitano from Media del Arte has joined us to give the fine representation of how to have that sword go skyward. But unless you are actually in a Commedia del Arte play, you will be mocked at and ridiculed rather than being appreciated. It is also possible that you will likely hurt somebody as the sword is flailing around. So to behave badly, get that sword up in the air. Ladies, I did not want to forget about all of us and how we behave badly. So let's talk my two favorite passages because there's actually a huge portion in here about how you should groom and make sure to tie your stockings on appropriately before leaving home. But we're, there weren't any great quotes, so I skipped those. First, at this time, it would have been common for the ladies to be wearing Chopin's. Chopin's. Uh, I have a picture here of what these might look like. So these were typically made out of wood and they're going to raise you a few inches off the ground. However, much like uh, clogs, they have no heel. So for any of us who have ever worn shoes like that, you know that they don't necessarily stay on the best. They're going to take some practice to walk in. Now, if you want to behave badly, don't do any of that practice. And instead, just clomp around with those things so much that you remind everyone of Franciscan friars. Just make all the noise in the world. Um, that way you attract all the attention. Then also, it will come to this when we talk about how to sit properly. When you're sitting, a poorly behaved lady is going to reveal those Chopins. 
as well when they're seated because their farthingale is going to rise too far up to show uh, them. So we always want to keep those hidden and instead just enjoy the height boost out of it. Now how to actually walk in chopines, I've not tried this because I don't own any, is you should raise the toe of your foot, straighten the knee, and then set it back down and do the same on the other foot. You should not just be sliding along the ground, which seems like it would be easier not to lose the, sh the Chopin, but is going to make the unfortunate racket that will draw, Ill will draw the scornful eyes of everybody who is watching you at the ball or in court. How to dress properly, and I see some of my locals on here, they will love this. There are ways, improper ways to wear the dress. I've once again given you a picture of a dress so you can imagine how big it is. We've got our farthingale out, we've got a nice long train. So there's a number of behaviors you should not do while wearing a dress, or you should do if you would like to behave badly. For one, when you're seated with that long train, you clearly would like that train under the chair. However, as we see here in a couple, you're not supposed to touch it with your hands. So a badly behaved lady is going to close the train with their foot exactly as cats do to speak disrespectfully. I have six cats around here. I'm not entirely sure what he's talking about here, that how the cat is moving its foot that is so disrespectful to uh, how they're drawing the train in. I'm imagining it's sweeping around, but I have not seen a cat do that. Also proving cats have been misbehaving for 400 years as well. The next one we talked about with the Chopin's that you should not be seeing them is when you seat yourself, if you sit too far back in the seat, uh, what you see is uh, you, your farthingale will raise the dress and we will see as much as half her legs. So that's about knee height. So again, folks who come to my normal university classes and see me teach, that's typically where I'm raising my dress up so you can see my legs. I clearly have mastered the behaving badly with dresses. My favorite one is that they, that of how to behave badly, is that they raise their farthingales to the race with their right hand. I was first thinking, why is this calling out the right hand? It is more noble. Is it okay if I raise my dress with my left hand? It's because your left hand, ladies, is going to be uh, resting in the Lord's right hand as you are dancing or as you're being escorted around. So your right hand would be available to help move your dress. Now, it is ill behavior and quite unseemly for you to raise your dress to show off that pretty underdress of yours. Now, I can certainly see the appeal to that. You've spent a lot of money to have this beautiful underdress. You should maybe accidentally raise that dress a little bit so everyone who can admire your underdress. But be careful in doing so that you don't accidentally grab the petticoats too and lift them as you're raising that dress because it shall, my favorite, reveal such things as modesty will not permit me to mention. Whew. We are seeing stockings. We are seeing legs. We are lifting up head and coat. the thighs. And the thighs. We're, we're seeing so much by lifting that dress. So the dress should stay down. And ladies, we should not be touching our dresses. But if you would like to behave badly, go ahead, lift it. Show off that underskirt. I suppose we should talk about how to actually wear the dress. So we mentioned that wearing the farthingale is going to be a large hoop skirt. It's going to be fairly rigid with um, a number of uh, reeds or rope along the edges to keep the shape. Um, and thus it is going to be a little bit harder to move the dress around. But if you walk properly, you can slither like a snake in order to move the dress. I have in fact done this. Um, I do have a dress that works for this. And it does help if you get your hips moving a little bit, you can get enough movement with the dress that will move the train along. Um, so it takes a little practice. And I encourage you all, if you'd like to behave properly, especially in dance practices, go ahead and wear your farthingale and the overskirt to get practice with those sorts of items. 
And when you seat yourself, instead of sitting all the way back, go ahead and just sit halfway back in the seat, such as this lady is doing. This is a woodcut from uh, Negri. However, she does not appear to be wearing a farthingale, but it was the only woodcut that I found where we did have a lady in a dress uh, seated. So that would be how you would wear your dress and sit properly. So let's talk about three steps. As I mentioned earlier, the book has, or the manuscripts have beautifully elegant written out how to do basically all the steps you could possibly need to know. We can do that another time. I chose the ones that can really show how to behave badly and are fantastic quotes. So we're going to talk about walking, because yes, you can walk wrong, continent, continence, and grave reverence. So walking, if you walk properly, and whether you dance or not, you too can behave badly anywhere at any of our events and have the sight, in all these ways, the sight of watchers will be offended. So quite the easy power by walking improperly. So you can walk with your feet apart and just kind of fall over those legs. Or you can walk with your feet apart and just kind of waddle along. This is not a fine thing to do. Another way to be ill behave is kind of falling forward over your steps. And as you can imagine, like we've seen plenty of movies where these have happened and it is kind of a lower class thing to do to walk improperly like this. Or you can have great business you're going to. And then finally, if we are doing a time warp, our legs are apart, our knees are together, but we're not going to do the rest of the time warp dance. We are going to try and walk improperly with that. You, so if you would like to behave improperly, you have many choices. You don't even have to be on the dance floor to do so because you can offend everybody just how you walk. The continence. So this properly done is our nice step where we slide and up and down. And so our dancers know this is a very graceful move. And my dancers in particular know I love doing this to get our calves of steel. Well, you can do this so improperly that it looks like you're having an exercise yourself. So we're getting the demons out because you are just going all over. Quite improper. The second way, and there's, these are actually in the same paragraph together, so we don't even need a quote break, is when you're doing it, you can step far enough out and in his words, seem as if you are about to urinate. Thank you, Caruso. We cannot mention what happens when a, a fine lady is lifting up her dress, but no problem to say, sure, spread those legs and you are about to urinate yourself in doing uh, the continenza. And finally, the grave reverence. Properly done, left foot's going forward, back, down and up, it's smooth, it's beautiful. However, you can do this wrong and make everyone die laughing. You can go down and when you come up, just go ahead and thrust that body around. So if you're oh, thrusting it forward, Everyone's just going to die laughing. You're muted, but I can tell you are dying laughing right now. The other way, and I truly appreciate that this is in a fine Italian manuscript, is that instead, if, when you're doing this, doing the nice movement, you're just going straight down and up. And I do have hands as well, and I imagine it is you know, sticking your butt out and going down and up. And you can, as a fine gentleman, truly resemble a hen about to lay an egg. Croso, thank you so much for your writing. Now the, the last section I'm going to go through is talking a little bit more about balls. So I'm going to give you the context of the ball, talk about eye direction, inviting someone to dance, how to be seated, and then once again, those pesky gloves. So I talked a little bit at the top of the hour about um, the balls. So 
the room would be set up that you would have parallel lines of seats across the rooms, the lords on one side and the ladies on the other. Now, this would be supervised and it'd be your, your chance to contact the other group. However, it would also be supervised and noted in how many times you perhaps invited someone of the opposite gender to dance. For if you invited them too many times, that may show your love and therefore incite much gossip as to whether there is something more going on there. So you would have to be very thoughtful in how you invited people to dance. In addition, there, and talk about this in seat selection as well, if the chairs of the lords and the ladies got too close to each other, the sponsor may choose to call off the ball altogether. Uh, Negri specifically states that. So you need to keep your distance uh, in order to not cause a scandal. The seating is also going to be based on precedence and honor. The seating towards the front of the room is going to be more prestigious. So they talk about who to seat where, and it will actually go into, goes into some detail about, well, the princes would be seated here, but this rank, a duke would be behind. And so they'd be honor based on where you were sitting. So you have to think uh, carefully as to where you are seated and whether you are insulting someone based on where they are seated. Um, we talked about earlier, there's typically only one set of people dancing at a time, which gives everybody else the chance to watch and observe and notice the every move you are making. So that's why we have such rules to make sure that you are behaving properly or improperly if you would like to be the talk of the town. So now we have a little bit of talk about balls, talk about eye directions. So this was specifically talking to the lords in reference to the galliard. So the step, step, the five steps kicks uh, dance, which I won't go into for this. But he states very clearly, do not raise your eyes so awkwardly high as to be as resemble an astronomer gazing at the stars. And I could see the desire to do this, that as you're doing these kicks, you're gonna to wanna to look up because it will help you actually move your kick up. And instead, you wanna keep your eyes level. But what the part of the quote that made me wanna include this was again, calling out the do not do it to arouse universal criticism. Now I wanna know whether he did a play on words around universal and astrologer or not. My guess is not but I found it amusing. Also, this is a translation from uh, Italian into English, so perhaps not. Um, but he is basically saying that it is like high school. Everybody will laugh at you and criticize you for looking too high. Now, ladies, you do get a chance to invite gentlemen to dance. You are not always just sitting on the side waiting for a gentleman to dance. For notably, if you do not have to dance at all. Gentlemen, if you are at the ball and you are invited to dance, you must. Ladies, if you would like to not dance, you can wear your, your mantle or your cape. And that is a sign that you would like to not dance and just observe instead. So um, that is an option available to you, but you can also invite gentlemen to dance. But there are many ways you can do this badly. So first, when approaching the line of gentlemen, remember they're all in this row of chairs, you can come up to them with eyes so low that you are looking at the ground and the gentleman cannot tell who is going, you are requesting to dance. And thus the wrong person may stand up. So if your eyes are too low, you are ensuing a scandal, ladies. So clearly the right answer is to look straight at the gentleman. However, and again, love this so much, is that still other ladies, so we know they were doing it, invite gentlemen by beckoning with their hands. Oh, you can see them doing that too. Come here, come dance with me. Or with their heads. You know these moves too, the little flirty. Where they're, they're calling to a gentleman, catching his eye and beckoning with their heads. Or the most unseemly one, calling them by name, just saying out that, you know, I would like you, Lord, to dance with me. And how unseemly that is. 
Instead, if you would like to not cause a stir and be quite the scandal, when you approach the line of gentlemen who are, are seated, you look directly at the gentleman who you would like to dance. Now, if you got this wrong, or the gentleman got it wrong, and perhaps the gentleman in the second row of seats stands up to dance with you, well, it would be quite a scandal to refuse him. And thus, you should go ahead and dance with whichever gentleman uh, stood up and accepted your invitation. However, while he is doing that, because remember, he has taken off his gloves that should not take longer than an Ave Maria to take off. It, it does not do you any good to stand as a statue. They actually mentioned that, but it didn't make the slide, that you should not stand still like a statue. Instead, you should pretend to adjust your dress, maybe strutting a little s slightly, maybe turning sideways to the gentleman. You know what I find fascinating? Is that Carosa wrote this down. It's not just that we are sitting here thinking, well, I wonder if humans did that, of just let me be a little flirty, let me adjust my dress. Caroso, in his manuscript, took the time to say, ladies, here's what you should do while you're waiting for the gentleman to stand to you. You should play with your dress. When you're seated, you should play with your fan or your gloves so that you don't look like a statue. So let's talk a little bit more seat selection. So this is actually across two different rules in Caroso, and I've sent these slides out so you can reference all the rules and notes later. It is quite reprehensible to take somebody else's seat. As we just mentioned earlier, where the seat is is quite important. Where it is in the hall, but there also just may not be enough seats. You can imagine this if you've had siblings where you call dibs on your seat. It should stay open, but as you can imagine, well, your siblings also do not listen to the fact that you have dibs on your seat and they will in fact take it. However, this is considered improper to take somebody else's seat at the hall. I mentioned earlier, if the seating gets too close, the sponsor will call off the ball and this is mentioned in one of the notes. Now, let's say you've been improper as clearly we all here in this class now can do. If you did take somebody's seat, you should do the, the, the fine thing of pretending to rise and offering it back. Here, you can have the, your seat back. And then a fine gentleman would say, no, 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 I will not take the seat. We've all witnessed this encounter with paying a bill at the restaurant. As soon as that first person reaches for it and makes the offer, everybody else says, great, I, I will happily help pay with no intention of doing it. So Caruso is basically saying the same thing was happening with seats. Here, I will stand and rise and you can have your seatbelt back. Oh, no, no, it's, it's fine, I have this. However, if there are stools, you should not make the other gentleman be constrained to be remain standing. Therefore, you should give up half your stool and sit there. Now let's go back to those pictures we had early of what the gentleman is wearing and most notably, his sword. So while you're seated on the stool, think carefully of how your sword is going back, who you are hitting with it as two of you share a stool. And then similarly praiseworthy is think about where you are seated. Now finally, I save the best for last. Oh, I've dropped my glove. What shall I do? Humans have not changed in 400 years. So ladies, to behave badly and cause quite the stir and have the gentleman running like a flock of starlings, go ahead and drop that glove. Make the whole room aware of what you've done. Notably, in the section about ladies how to groom yourself, he references that if you do not tie your stockings on properly or other things that modesty does not permit him to mention, those two could fall during a dance causing gentlemen to bestir themselves. So ladies, you, how, this is my favorite way of how you can behave badly. And since I just went through a whole bunch of slides and we really just wanna condense how to behave badly, let's talk through the final points. One, show that disgusting cap. Forget your cape altogether, which again, many of us already do. You can bite your glove and have that sword pointing up. So before even getting to the event, you can dress and act 
badly. As you move, walking into that event, those legs apart, swaggering around, making an unsightly scene. As you're doing your continenze, just get those legs wide open and you know, stand a little bit. And then doing your reverence, go ahead, sit like a hen. That will be the most rude and unsightly behavior. And balls, have those eyes up and steal some seats. For ladies, make a ruckus. Loudly bang your chopines everywhere so they know you are coming. And that way, when you raise that dress, everyone can see your lovely underdress and or what modesty will not permit me to say. When you are moving, do not sit too still, fidget with that dress, have your eyes too low. And the balls, where you can truly cause quite the scandal, beckon a man with your hand, your head, or call him by name, you too can steal seats. And as we said, you can drop a glove and get all the gentlemen running like a flock of starlings. <laughs>